ओके बिस्मिल्लाह रहमान रहीम वेलकम टू ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट नाउ आई विल ट्राई टू स्टार्ट इन टाइम व्हिच इज नाउ ऑलमोस्ट 2 पीएम एंड द हेडिंग ऑफ दिस सेशन इज लिम्फोप्रोलिफरेटिव एंड प्लाज्मा सेल डिसऑर्डर और डिस्क्रेजियास डॉक्टर मेहरी हु इज ऑल्सो द कर्नर एंड एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एंड कंसल्टेंट हेमेटोलॉजिस्ट एट आमपुर इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ बोन मेरो ट्रांसप्लांट इन रावलपिंडी विल चेयर दिस सेशन अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट वी हैव टू मोर पैनलिस्ट वन इज डॉक्टर मुनीरा मुसाजी हु इज ऑल्सो एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एंड माई कुलीग at akuh and uh, she has a special interest in lymphomas including both uh, non hodgkin and hodgkin lymphoma as well as auto transplant apart from that dr rahil most of us know him very well he is also pro associate professor and consultant hematologist at afi bmt uh, rawalpindi and we all know he is young energetic humble and down to earth person with exceptional research interest and a good number of papers uh, 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 in his account now because uh, there are uh, three talks one is uh, related to myeloma and two is uh, actually uh, belong to uh, lymphomas one is diffuse large b cell lymphoma other one is the mantle cell lymphoma now as the two panelists also uh, are the speakers for diffuse large b cell uh, lymphoma and uh, management of mantle cell lymphoma so i have to introduce only professor muzaffar uh, khizalbash and uh, dr khizalbash is the director of myeloma transplantation and cellular therapy at md anderson uh, cancer center texas and he is associated with this center for approximately for last 20 years or so uh his uh, contribution is that that uh, he actually run one of the largest myeloma program of usa he is a, actually myeloma man and he has published more than 235 research articles in international journal so i welcome all the panelists and the uh, uh, speakers now before starting uh, uh, the talks i just have a little bit of background in 2 to 3 minutes so we must know what is going on from cancer perspective because this session is belong to some uh, subdivision or sub uh, subdivision of cancer like lymphoma and myeloma so you people are aware of that there is an agency with the name of globocon which give us some idea that, that how much number of new cancer cases in pakistan in a given year and out of those how many are belong to hematological uh, or belong to hematological malignancies so say for example but there is yes there are there are many discrepancies in it because st study is not a simple one say for example new cases in pakistan which was uh, published in globocon in 2020 is just 178000 as compared to 1.9 billion uh, when compared to usa statistics although usa population is approximately 32 3320 million or 330 million as compared to 220 million in pakistan that's been one is to 1.5 ratio as far as the population is concerned but there is a large discrepancy in the numbers of cancer either this is a true representation or there is a definite low incidence or prevalence of malignancy in our part of the world and we compare with the overall world statistics it is approximately 1% of the total cancer actually happens in pakistan just 1% of the total now the other aspect is that say for example which i which i can't uh, comp, uh, actually explain or someone can put light on it say for example in a given year the commonest malignancy world over is is the carcinoma of the breast 
and in the usa in a in 2021 the uh, the case which were reported was 280000 as compared to just 25000 in pakistan but on the other hand solid tumor people said that every eighth or ninth woman in pakistan had a chance in a lifetime which i don't understand when i calculated the whole figure now come to this special hematological topics say for example in uh, 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 non hodgkin lymphomas only 7000 were reported in 2020 as compared to 80000 in usa so there is a huge difference which is unable i am unable to explain similarly hodgkin lymphoma only 1600 as compared to 9000 in us and only 2000 multiple myeloma in pakistan as compared to 35000 in america so let's see uh, how we can take it but overall say for example out of 178000 new cases in 2020 only 10% are actually related to hematological malignancy only 10% that is approximately 18000 total hematological tot um, among the whole one semit yet only 10% that's a 18000 when we calculate the acute leukemias non hodgkin lymphoma hodgkin lymphoma and multiple myeloma okay thank you now please upload the presentation of dr uh, muzaffar khazalbash the role of car t cell therapy in relapse refractory multiple myeloma thank you thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this meeting uh, the title of my presentation is role of car t cell therapy in relapse refractory multiple myeloma as uh, some of you know uh, i am muzaffar kazabash i'm a professor in the department of stem cell transplantation at md anderson cancer center in houston where i serve as director of the myeloma transplantation and cellular therapy program so here are my disclosures with some research funding So despite recent advances in treatment multiple uh, myeloma remains an incurable disease the median overall survival of patients refractory to proteasome inhibitors immunomodulatory drugs and anti cd38 monoclonal antibodies is uh, less than 9 months similarly median overall survival for patients refractory to anti cd38 monoclonal antibodies two proteasome inhibitors and two immunomodulatory drugs the so called penta refractory patients is only 5.6 months so, so clearly novel immunotherapy approaches uh, that may improve outcomes in these patients are needed so this slide summarizes novel immunotherapy agents targeting multiple myeloma cell surface proteins they can be divided into three separate groups uh first one are the car t cells most advanced being ida cell and silta cell that we will talk about uh, another group of immunotherapy is by specific t cell engagers teclastamab and talquetamab and the third group is the antibody drug conjugates one of them belantamab mafetotin is now fda approved and available for the treatment of advanced myeloma patients in the united states so this talk was uh mostly focused on car t cells so car t cells are autologous or allogeneic t lymphocytes that are genetically engineered to express a cell surface receptor that recognizes one or more tumor specific surface antigens so currently uh mostly second and later generation of car t cells are in use and they consist of uh number 1 an extra cellular antigen binding domain which mostly consists of a variable region of heavy or light chain of immunoglobulin molecule uh each car t cell or car construct also has a transmembrane domain and an intracellular domain and this intracellular domain consists of co-stimulatory molecules either cd28 or cd137 or and a t cell activation molecule which in most situations is cd3 zeta so this slide depicts a car t cell design so on the left is ida cell the most advanced 
of the CAR T cell and on the right is cell to cell. So I will take you through um, the IDA cell. So in order to uh, generate this CAR T cell, first a viral vector is used to genetically engineer this T cell. And then here is the CAR construct or the CAR molecule that results from this transduction. So the CAR molecule has this external antigen or tumor binding domain, which binds to the surface antigen on the tumor cell like BCMA. This is the transmembrane domain. And then these are the intracellular domains, the co-stimulatory molecule, in this case, CD137 or 41BB, and then the T cell stimulation or T cell activation domain which is CD137. The difference between IDA cell and SILTA cell is that uh, SILTA cell is pretty much similar to IDA cell, but it has uh, two antigen binding epitopes, which increase its avidity of binding to the tumor cell. So this slide depicts potential CAR T targets in multiple myeloma. These are all surface antigens that uh, we know about, BCMA, there's CD19, CD38, GPR, C5D. But the most common and most extensively studied is BCMA. And we will focus on BCMA in the coming slides. So first, a few words about the BCMA molecule. As I mentioned, it is expressed on the surface of plasma cells. Uh, here you can see a BCMA expressed on the surface of plasma cell binding to its uh, ligand April. So in normal physiologic setting, uh, BCMA molecule in plasma cells supports the survival of long-lived plasma cells. It leads to the production of antibody molecules, and it also helps in class switch of immunoglobulin molecules. However, in multiple myeloma, it has a different role. Here, BCMA molecule promotes proliferation and survival of myeloma cells. It is associated with immunosuppressive bone marrow microenvironment, uh, which again helps in the propagation of disease and increased surface BCMA level is associated with disease progression and poor outcome. So next I will uh, be focusing on CAR T cells and this slide summarizes two groups of CAR T cells, those that are BCMA directed and those that are either bispecific or non-BCMA directed. So in the BCMA directed CAR T cells, IDA cell and SILTA cell are most advanced and rest of my talk will be highlighting the results with these two. One important uh, thing that these are both autologous CAR T cells, but there is focus on a third uh, type of CAR T cells or allogenic or off the shelf CAR T cells. And one of them that is in clinical trial is ALO715. Uh, the non-BCMA directed or bispecific CAR T cells include CTL019, which is a CD19 directed CAR T cells that is used in lymphomas, and then bispecific CAR T cells that target two separate antigens, BCMA and another molecule, either CD19 or CD38. And then there are some other targets that we saw in the previous slide against which CAR T cells are in production. So my focus will be on two CAR products, IDA cell and SILTA cell, which are more, most advanced in the treatment of multiple myeloma. Uh, so first, IDA cell. Uh, so uh, IDA cell, as many of you know, is now approved by US uh, FDA for the treatment of relapse refractory multiple myeloma. And this one, this was based on this clinical trial, which was published last year in New England Journal of Medicine, the so-called KARMA trial. And in this trial, the eligible patients all had relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma. Uh, their age was 18 or older. They had at least three prior regimens that included an immunomodulatory drug, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. And all patients were refractory to their last regimen. 
Uh, and here is the treatment uh, schema uh, that all patients underwent leukapheresis where lymphocytes were collected and were sent to the company for manufacturing of CAR T cells. These patients could receive some kind of bridging therapy for up to 14 days before the start of their lymphodepleting regimen. And as many of you are aware, to achieve the maximum function of CAR T cells, it's important to give some lymphodepleting therapy before the CAR T cell infusion. So patients received uh, uh, lymphodepleting therapy consisting of fludarabine and cyclophosphamide over three days, day minus five, minus four, and minus three, followed by CAR T cell infusion on day zero in varying doses starting at 150 million and increasing to 450 million cells. So again, we saw the CAR T cell construct in the previous slides. So uh, this table summarizes the baseline characteristics, and I'm highlighting the salient features of these uh, characteristics. 128 patients were treated in the SCARMA trial, which was published in New England Journal last year. The median age was 61. 35 patients, 35% uh, patients had high risk chromosomal abnormalities. 47% uh, patients had prior autologous stem cell transplant. And these patients were heavily pretreated, as you can see, with median prior lines of treatment being six, and it's ranging from three to 16. 84% patients had triple refractory disease, meaning their median survival was less than nine months. And 26% patients had penta refractory disease, meaning that they were refractory to all these drugs. And these patients in general have a median survival of less than six months. So uh, this slide summarizes the responses with a single dose of Ida cell. And you can see in this final bar here to the right that the overall response rate with a single dose of CAR T cell after lymphodepleting therapy was 73%. This is unprecedented for any new drug. And 33% of these patients achieved a complete remission. Uh, if you remember with autologous stem cell transplant before the use of current novel agents and maintenance therapy, uh, only about 20 to 30 percent patients used to achieve a complete remission rate. So this is again unprecedented. And overall response was 73 percent. And as you can see in these three bars here, the response rates uh, went up with increasing dose with the highest CR and overall response rate being seen at the highest dose of 450 times 10 to the 6. The next slide summarizes the duration of response and survival. The median time to first response was one month, so you can see the response pretty quickly, and the median time to achieving a complete remission was less than three months. So, so I will take you th uh, through these different uh, figures. So figure A shows that the duration of response basically overall is here, uh, which was uh, for all comers was 10.7 months, but it went up with dose and the highest dose level, the duration of response was 11.3 months. Similarly, uh, duration of response according to best response, as one could guess, patients who achieved a deeper response like complete remission had a longer duration of response than those who did not achieve a complete remission. Progression-free survival uh, was uh, also uh, based on the overall uh, patients treated was 8.8 .8 months, but with higher dose, uh, the progression-free survival was longer. It was longer than 8.8 .8 months in those who received 450 million cells. And the final figure, figure D, shows overall survival. And overall survival for all patients treated was 19.4 months. And these are the patients that, as we saw in patient characteristics, have generally a median overall survival of nine months or definitely less than a year. 
So again, much better results than what would expect with any other treatment or with standard of care in these patients. So in terms of toxicity, so CAR T cells, of course, are associated with significant adverse events. And there are some very unique toxicities that we see with CAR T cells, uh, and they include cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. So cytokine release syndrome, mainly consisting of fever, low blood pressure, hypotension, and hypoxia was seen in 84% of patients. And the median time to onset of CRS was uh, only one day, but the median duration was about five days. Um, luckily, most of these side effects were milder with only 6% patients achieving grade three or higher uh, CRS at the highest dose level. Neurotoxicity consisting of mental status changes, so subtle changes in handwriting and other uh, abnormalities was seen in uh, less than 20% patients. Uh, uh, again, median time to onset was only two days and the median duration was three days. Uh, and there was no grade four or five uh, neurotoxicity seen. And again, as you know, these can be treated with anti-IL-6 agents uh, uh, like tocilizumab or sultuximab and sometimes with steroids. So uh, cytopenias are also common and um, due to a combination of lymphodepleting therapy and CAR T cells and can be seen in up to 90% of patients. Uh, Treatment-related mortality or death was seen in 3%, which in such a high-risk population and heavily pre-treated patients was uh, relatively safe. So based on these results, uh, uh, Ida cell was approved by Food and Drug Administration in the United States for patients with relapse or, or refractory multiple myeloma who had received four or prior lines of treatment. So next, I will focus on the second CAR T cell product, Silta cell, and this CAR T cell product was tested in CAR T1 trial. And the results of this trial were also published in uh, 2021. This one was published in Lancet. Jesus Berdea was the first author. So in terms of treatment schedule and schematic, it was about the same as the IDA cell. And in terms of CAR T construct or structure, as we saw that it is similar to IDA cell, except that it has two antigen binding domains, uh, and they are basically um, designed to confer avidity to the tumor antigen. So in this phase one cartitude trial, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, the median follow-up was 12.4 months. Toxicity was manageable and pretty similar to what we saw with IDSL. Overall response rate was 97% as opposed to 73% with IDSL. And stringent complete remission was 67%, which was the double of what we see with IDSL. Uh, after 12 months, progression-free survival and overall survival rates were 77 and 89 percent, and median progression-free survival and median duration of response were not reached. Um, just uh, to uh, highlight median progression-free survival with uh, uh, IDA cell was 8.8 .8 months, and median duration of response with IDA cell was uh, about 10 months. So um, here are the demographics. This was from an update that was presented at American Society of Hematology in December 2021 with a follow-up now extending to two years. So again, the same number of patients, 97 uh, patients were treated, 57% uh, male, 20% patients had uh, uh, plasma cytomas, 23% uh, had high-risk cytogenetics, six uh, prior lines of treatment, which is similar to what was seen with the uh, IDA cell. And then triple exposed uh, patients were 97% and penta exposed were 81%. And then uh, also would like to highlight that 85% patients were triple refractory and 41% were penta refractory. And these were the patients with a six month median progression-free survival. 
and 96% of patients were refractory or resistant to their last line of treatment. So uh, here we're highlighting the response rate. So again, more than 95 or 94% had greater than very good partial remission and 82% had stringent complete response rate. And as you can see here, the stringent CR rate increased over time. So at one year, as reported in the Lancet paper, the stringent CR rate was 67%, and it increased to 83% after a two-year follow-up. So the responses deepened over time. The median time to response was one month, and median time to best response was 2.6 months. So this was similar to what was seen with IDASEL. Uh, median duration of response was not estimable. Uh, it was uh, between 22 months to not evaluable. And 60 or more than 60% of patients were still alive and progression-free after two years. And these were heavily pretreated patients. So uh, this slide summarizes the progression-free survival. The two-year progression-free survival was 60.5%, and it was longer in patients who had achieved a stringent CR. And overall survival after two years was 74% and medium has, median has not been reached. And again, these were the patients where median survival would have been less than one year. And here, uh, almost three fourths of the patients are alive after two years. So the conclusions from this CARTITUDE 1 trial that after a median follow-up of two years, uh, these patients had durable and deepening responses, including minimal residual disease negativity, which was achieved in 92% patients. Uh, and mm, the Silta cell product also has manageable safety profile comparable to Ida cell. And these encouraging data suggest that it will be an important treatment options for patients with myeloma down the road. So finally, the conclusions from this presentation on CAR T cells, uh, that BCMA CAR T therapies have improved outcomes for relapse refractory multiple myeloma significantly. Some of the highest overall responses ever seen have been with CAR T cells. Progression-free survival significantly improved with just one dose of CAR T cells, especially in patients who achieve deep responses. And there is no maintenance treatment after CAR T cells, just one and done. And earlier use of CAR T cells in first and second line, especially for high-risk patients, uh, are ongoing and will help us decide on how to use this product. Uh, there are some important questions for the next five to 10 years that how do we sequence or combine both autologous stem cell transplant and BCMA-directed CAR T cells or bispecific antibodies? And this obviously will be studied in clinical trials. And then how do we cure patients with CAR T cells? And we need better understanding of mechanisms of responses and resistance. Uh, so... Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to acknowledge some of my colleagues uh, who has uh, helped me uh, with this presentation. And many of them provided, generously provided some of their slides that I could present. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to take up your questions. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kazalbash. Now. Uh... We will take question on this hot topic uh, at the end. Now, the second talk is related to, related to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. That is the management of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, low-income countries. And Dr. Rai Iftaghar already uh, published a paper uh, regarding this topic in an international journal. So I request Dr. Rahil uh, to start. With talk. Thank you. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I'm Dr. Rahil Iftakhar, working as a clinical hematologist at Armed Forces Bone Marrow Transplant Center. Am I, and I'm extremely thankful to Pakistan Society of Hematology for inviting me to deliver this talk 
on the diagnosis and management of diffuse large B cell lymphoma in low income countries. So Winston Churchill said, to improve is to change and to be perfect is to change often. As per 2016 US lymphoma statistics, B cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma constitute 85% of all the NHLs. And out of these, diffuse large B cell lymphoma constitute 25% of all the mature non-Hodgkin lymphomas. However, a study from South of Pakistan has shown that the frequency of diffuse large B cell lymphoma was 69% among all the histopathological specimens that were seen at that hospital. This frequency is significantly higher as compared to that of the Western data. One of the hypotheses is that it is because most of the patients in low resource countries like Pakistan do not seek medical advice until they become severely symptomatic. So for low grade lymphomas, they have either isolated lymphadenopathy or uh, for that matter, visromagaly. So uh, the symptoms are not severe enough that they warrant medical attention. And once they warrant medical attention, uh, they have either transformed or they have de novo diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So the frequency was much higher in our population. The overall survival of diffuse large B cell lymphoma has improved significantly over the last decade. For patients less than 45 years of age, the five-year overall survival is approaching 85 to 90% in Western countries. A major reason for this improved survival is improvement in supportive care and the plethora of newer agents which were approved by FDA over the last decade, ranging from targeted agents to CAR T-cell therapy and bispecific antibodies. However, real-world challenges are different. Most of the patients have to pay out of their pocket. As a result, they are unable to bear the expenses of investigations and treatment. Their lack of proper general physician system in Pakistan, as a result, the diagnosis is either delayed or patients initially receive treatment for unrelated um, diagnosis like tuberculosis, autoimmune disorders, until they are diagnosed as diffuse large B cell lymphoma in an advanced stage with compromised organs. Moreover, their lack of quality radiological, histopathological, and molecular diagnostics, which are trained in heme oncology. We do not have purpose built oncology centers across Pakistan except one to two. Moreover, there are no disease related registries. As a result, we do not have data on epidemiology diagnosis, resource utilization, and outcomes of these disorders in Pakistan. And above all, there are no local guidelines to guide newly uh, trained physicians for management of these disorders. Pakistan Society of Hematology, in collaboration with Society of Medical Oncology Pakistan and Pakistan Society of Clinical Oncology took initiative to develop the guidelines for diagnosis and management of diffuse large B cell lymphoma in Pakistan. The guideline methodology that was used was modified Delphi method, and it is the same methodology that is used by American Society of Clinical Oncology for guideline development. The guideline committee had chairs and co-chairs, including president of Society of Medical Oncology, Society of Hematology, and Society of Clinical Oncology. There was a steering committee of seven members and an expert consensus panel of 23 members. So there were 33 members in all, which actually overlooked these guidelines. And these included hematologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, histopathologists, and bone marrow transplant specialists. The first step was to identify the questions which we face in our clinics in real world. After those questions were identified, they were circulated among steering committee members to finalize them. After finalization, initial draft recommendations were made by steering committee using literature search, practical experience, and resource challenges we have in hand. For each question, steering committee consensus was achieved. Once a consensus of more than 75% was achieved, these guidelines were then sent to expert panel 
for their review. So for all the guidelines, initially steering committee gave an approval and generate a consensus. And once steering committee consensus was achieved, they were then sent to expert panel for consensus generation. So once 75% or more consensus was achieved for all the guideline questions, they were then sent to chairs and co-chairs for final approval. This process actually took eight months uh, in 2021. And after that, these guidelines were sent to publication. And they were published in American Society of Clinical Oncology Journal, Journal of Clinical Oncology, Global Oncology, in December 2021. So I will uh, review the guidelines recommendations focusing on limited resources. In our guideline, we actually did resource allocation depending upon patient's affordability and available healthcare services. As a result, um, patients were divided into basic, limited, and enhanced resource settings. Majority of our patients and our hospitals fall in limited resources. So the guidelines, which I'll be discussing today, would be focusing on limited resources. The first guideline question that was posed was, what initial investigations are required for the initial diagnosis of TLBCL? The tissue requirement is an excisional lymph node biopsy. If excisional lymph node biopsy cannot be done, then true cut biopsy is an acceptable option. However, fine needle aspiration cytology should not be done because it results in loss of available tissue, inadequate specimen, and above all, it has high false negativity. As a result, the diagnosis can be missed. Moreover, once our tissue is available, in presence of characteristic morphology, immunohistochemistry is required for the diagnosis. Limited IHC is available across most of the centers of Pakistan, and the guideline committee recommended uh, documentation of CD20 positivity with CD3 negativity and high CHI-67 to confirm the diagnosis of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The emphasis was made on initial IHC that it should be done because in absence of IHC on a morphology alone, 20 to 30% patients can be missed or can be misdiagnosed. So it is important to have a uh, true diagnosis before starting treatment because once the patient enters treatment pathway, then the diagnosis is frequently not relooked. Considering resource limitation, subtyping and differentiating DLBCL from other hybrid lymphomas, that is BCL2, BCL6, MIC testing is not routinely recommended. However, it can be done for selected cases with CHI-67, that is more than 90%, that is a very high CHI-67, blastoid morphology and Richter transformation. So radiological imaging is important in order to see the functional organs as well as in order to see the staging. Contrast enhanced CT, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis should be done for all the cases. For patients with suspicion of neurological involvement, MRI with godolinum enhancement should be done. Uh, PET scan can divert resources away from treatment. It is a costly investigation available at limited centers. And for the patients who have to pay out of their pocket, who have limited resources, spending 60 000 to 70,000 rupees on PET scan can delay the start of treatment and can divert resources. So PET scan should be done only if resources permit in limited resource settings. If CT scan is used for staging, bone marrow examination should be done because it results in upstaging in around 20 to 30% of the patients. However, if PET scan is done, there is no requirement of bone marrow examination. For patients with high IPI, that is IPI score of three or more, lumbar puncture should be done to document CNS involvement. And at the time of lumbar puncture, intrathecal chemotherapy should be done. Now we'll move on to treatment of newly diagnosed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. It is important to consult hematology oncology multidisciplinary team if it is available in order to incorporate medical oncology, radiation oncology, histopathology, and radiology at the outset. So it is preferable to involve MDT, um, have an MDT approach if uh, the specialties are available. For limited stage non-bulky disease, uh, the initial treatment that is recommended by a guideline committee is CHOP with or without rituximab for three cycles. 
with 30 gray radiotherapy if it is a combined modality treatment approach or six cycles of CHOP with or without rituximab uh, for patients in which radiotherapy is not an option or is not available. We know that our CHOP is preferable. Addition of rituximab has resulted in improved progression-free survival and overall survival. However, the main cost of uh, the treatment in our CHOP is that of rituximab. So treatment should not be withheld because of non-availability of rituximab. Treatment should be started with CHOP chemotherapy. If rituximab is available from cycle two, it can be added. Or if there is no other option available, CHOP chemotherapy alone can be given. For patients with limited stage bulky disease, six cycles of uh, CHOP with or without rituximab uh, should be given. Again, our CHOP is preferable. However, we should not withhold treatment because of absence of rituximab availability. For initial treatment of advanced stage diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, six cycles of CHOP chemotherapy with rituximab are preferable. CNS prophylaxis in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is a matter of debate even in developed countries and in patients with advanced resources. For patients with IPI3 or more, intrathecal chemotherapy should be given as per our guideline recommendation because high-dose methotrexate is difficult to administer in resource-limited settings, it is challenging to manage, and the new studies have shown that there is no reduction in CNS relapses as compared to intrathecal chemotherapy if high-dose methotrexate is used. So this is a recently published randomized trial in blood advances in which high-risk BLBCL patients were randomized to high-dose methotrexate group versus non-high-dose methotrexate. There was no difference in CNS relapses, progression-free survival, and overall survival between two arms. On the contrary, patients receiving high-dose methotrexate had a higher frequency of mucositis, transaminitis, and uh, renal derangement. So for resource-limited settings, intrathecal chemotherapy is recommended for high-risk DLBCL patients for CNS prophylaxis. Once a treatment is over, end-of-treatment response assessment is important. In limited resources, CT scan should be used for response assessment as per Lugano classification of responses. However, if resources permit, PET-CT is preferable. Once PET-CT is done, it is important that it should be delayed for four to eight weeks after chemotherapy and 12 weeks post radiotherapy. Another thing which we have seen in COVID era is that once a patient has received COVID vaccination, PET scan should be delayed for at least eight weeks because of chances of false positivity. Another thing which uh, we mentioned in our guideline was that considering the resource limitation, Surveillance imaging is not recommended if end of treatment complete re remission is documented either with CT scan or PET scan. Consolidative radiotherapy is always uh, being considered for bulky disease. So what is the role uh, of end of treatment consolidative therapy as per our guidelines? If end of treatment remission is documented by CT scan, then radiotherapy to bulky or isolated skeletal mats should be done as per recover no radiotherapy and MIG trial. However, if PET scan is used for remission assessment, we can observe without radiotherapy. Recover trial actually showed that patient who received radiotherapy had a superior progression fee survival and overall survival as compared to patients who have not received radiotherapy. For relapsed refractory patient, management in limited resources is challenging because these patients have limited financial resources. There are lack of uh, properly uh, equipped centers in Pakistan who can manage relapse refractory patients with high-dose chemotherapy followed by uh, transplantation. And third, it can uh, put a significant financial and social burden on the family in limited resource countries like Pakistan. So it is always important to have a repeat biopsy to confirm relapse because we have seen patients of tuberculosis receiving treatment of salvage chemotherapy on the basis of isolated lymphadenopathy. So it is always better to confirm relapse and exclude non-malignant causes and alternate causes of lymphadenopathy while starting uh, salvage chemotherapy. Again, CT scan is recommended for staging purposes. 
the treatment uh, for relapse refractory patients for transplant eligible patients include gdp based therapy dhap or ice with rituximab so r gdp r dhap and r ice is used frequently so how to choose among them a randomized trial showed that gdp had a, a similar progression free survival and overall survival as uh, compared to dhap in patients of relapsed refractory diffuse large b cell lymphoma patients so our guideline recommended that gdp gdp with rituximab uh, preferably should be the first line salvage in our setting because gdp is associated with lesser neutropenia lesser hospitalization and has similar response rates alternate include uh, our ice and our dhap uh, and again rituximab if av available is preferable these patients should be transplanted if in complete remission or partial remission so this is a very interesting study which actually documented the effect of pre transplant disease status on outcomes if we see that patients who were transplanted in complete remission had a better probability of progression free survival and overall survival as compared to those who were transplanted in pr however the difference was not statistically significant and if you look at limited resource settings around 40 to 50% of the patients had uh, overall survival and progression free survival at 5 years so rather than not offering the treatment uh, for patients who have received second line salvage and are in pr if resources permit uh, autologous transplant consolidation should be done for these patients for ineligible patients cvp bendarutuxi and palliation should be offered palliation is a very important thing to consider and discuss in resource limited countries like pakistan because we know that there are a significant number of patients who are unable to um, bear the expenses of relapse refractory salvage chemotherapy and treatment so for these patients rather than um consuming and these patients spending millions of rupees on a outcome of 10 to 20% uh, case to case basis palliation should be offered to these patients upfront auto transplant in cr1 has not shown to improve progression free survival or overall survival in randomized trials so uh, for patients of diffuse large b cell lymphoma auto transplant in first cr is not recommended and this holds true more for a, a li limited resource countries like pakistan so auto transplant in dlbcl is not recommended in cr1 it is indicated for cr2 and beyond and can be considered in pr after salvage chemotherapy it is not indicated in cr1 for double expressive lymphomas or double hit lymphoma in limited resource countries like pakistan the age we took was less than 65 years ecop should be 0 to 1 and the patient should not have any major organ dysfunction there are special uh, circumstances which we encounter while managing diffuse large b cell lymphoma and pregnancy is one of them for first trimester uh, patients pregnancy termination is recommended because for these patients uh, in order to have a better fetal maternal outcome pregnancy termination should be done for second and third trimester chop chemotherapy can be given with or without rituximab however methotrexate should be avoided and chemotherapy should not be given in last few weeks before delivery because if chemotherapy is uh, given in last few weeks uh, before delivery it can result in fetal neutropenia and these uh, newborns have shown an increased frequency of neonatal sepsis secondary the mother if they have neutropenia at the time of delivery there are increased risk of peripheral sepsis so chemotherapy should be avoided in last 3 to 4 weeks before delivery for primary mediastinal b cell lymphoma r chop chemotherapy with radiotherapy should be used if ct scan is used for remission assessment for pet based end of treatment assessment radiotherapy can be omitted if end of treatment pet is negative we know that diffuse uh, dose adjusted epoc r has shown improved outcomes in pmbcl however considering limited resources absence of centers who have actually who can actually give infusional regimens in our guideline we have recommended r chop chemotherapy with radiotherapy uh, for primary mediastinal b cell lymphoma 
for testicular lymphoma, orchidectomy, followed by six cycles of CHOP with or without rotuximab, with CNS prophylaxis and scrotal irradiation should be offered. So this is one recommendation in which surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and CNS prophylaxis have been combined because this combination has shown to improve outcomes uh, to as high as 80 to 90 percent and all these things are doable even in limited resource settings so uh, this is the recommendation from our guideline for double expressor and double hit lymphoma our chop chemotherapy with intrathecal methotrexate is recommended uh, we know that there are limited centers who can offer dose registered epoch r so if resources permit in some centers it can be given however our guideline rec uh, committee recommends our chop with intrathecal methotrexate for elderly patients with diffuse large b cell lymphoma they are considered elderly in our guideline if they are more than 60 years it is uh, contrary to the western guidelines uh, but we have set, uh, set a cutoff limit of 60 years uh, for these patients to be considered for our mini chop, these patients should be given GCSF prophylaxis in order to prevent neutropenia. Alternatives include CVP, GCVP, and Bendamusti. I'll conclude by saying that local guidelines are required, adapted to challenges faced by physicians and patients in resource limited settings. We should not follow Western guidelines because the patient set is different. The genetics are different. The available resources are available uh, different. So uh, the guidelines of diffuse large B cell lymphoma has set a tone for collaboration. If we can join, we can work together. We can achieve success, and this success will translate into better patient outcomes. Inshallah. Thank you very much, all of you, for your patient listening. Thank you, Doctor Rahil. Uh... Excellent talk. Um, I personally have uh, very much interest in uh, DLBCL. So in the end, I will ask you a question. And uh, when you uh, collect the suggestion from uh, the hematologist, I also forwarded the few suggestions, which I will again discuss with you in after the last talk. Now, Dr. Munina Musaji, your consultant, hematologist oncologist at AKU and she will going to talk about new advancement in the management of mental cell lymphoma. G. Dr. Munira. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Munira Musaji. I am a uh, hematologist oncologist and a stem cell transplant physician at the Aachen University Hospital. And I want to begin by thanking the organizers of the Pakistan Society of Hematology uh, to invite me to give this talk today. Um, so today, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about advancements, advancements in the management of mantle cell lymphoma. So to begin with, I just want to go ahead and share what the current treatment paradigm is. Uh, so when we see a patient for the first time in our clinics, the first thing that we really look at is whether they are candidates for aggressive treatment or they're candidates for less aggressive treatment. So a younger patient, a fit patient, this is, some, this is the kind of patient that we would uh, really be uh, recommending a high-dose cytarabine-based reduction therapy followed by consolidation stem cell transplant along with rituximab maintenance, which is a standard of care. As we all know, rituximab maintenance in this setting really does have an overall survival benefit. In the less uh, aggressive uh, group of patients, that is our elderly patients with comorbidities, which are the most common kind of patients that we see with mantle cell lymphoma, we have a lot of options here. Um, Bendamustine rituximab, which really is one of the most favored regimens. Other options include r chop r And then the question of maintenance rituximab comes in, which is a little controversial, and I'm going to be addressing this in the next couple of slides. Moving on into the relapse refractory setting, proton tyrosine kinase inhibitors really are the new uh, go-to drugs in uh, in the relapse patients. Uh, we do have options of chemotherapy, but, this, but these really have changed the uh, treatment uh, algorithm. Third line, uh, in the third line setting, we have uh, the approval of a CAR T cell a product, BRAC, uh, Prexocaptogene, which is anti, which is a CD19 CAR T cell. Then I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
So the main topics that I'm going to um, concentrate on in my talk is uh, some of the controversies and the newer agents uh, and the new advancements in the treatment of mantle cell lymphoma in 2021. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the role of rituximab maintenance after BR induction. Uh, spend a little bit of time looking at the use of the BTK inhibitors as initial therapy. In the relapse refractory setting, we do know the BTK inhibitors have been approved, but are there any novel combinations? Are there any novel BTK inhibitors? And what is the benefit of CAR T cells? So the story of maintenance rituximab in mantle cell lymphoma, it really goes back about 15 years. Uh, this was the first study that was published in NEGM in 2012, which was conducted by the European MCL network. Um, they looked at a large group of patients. Uh, most of these patients were elderly patients. Their induction arm consisted of our job uh, or FCR. And then they randomized patients to either rituximab as maintenance therapy or interferon alpha as maintenance. So there were two uh, main findings, two or three main findings of the study. The first was that our job fared better than FCR. And the reason why the FCR did not fare as well is because it is highly toxic. And there was a lot more toxicity, the to toxic deaths when, when, uh, in the FCR arm. Second, in patients who were responding, in those patients, uh, maintenance rituximab had a statistically significant improvement in both progression-free survival and overall survival, as we see here, with the maintenance rituximab not reached. The caveat being the maintenance rituximab in this study was given indefinitely. Another thing to important point was that patients who do responded well to FCR were those was was that group that did not uh, really benefit from maintenance rituximab. So what do we do now when bendamustine rituximab is a standard of care and not our job in our uh, in our elderly patients. So this was looked at in the maintained study, which looked at a large group of uh, patients of 168 patients randomized after BR induction to our maintenance or observation. And this was presented at ASCO in 2012. And as you can see by these curves, they are self-explanatory that these curves overlap and there was no difference in um, progression-free survival between the two groups with a non-significant p-value. What is the more current data? Uh, this was an uh, abstract which was uh, presented by Brian Hill at at ASH in 2019. And this looked at a collaborative work of 12 US centers who, and all of these, in those centers, all of the patients had received frontline BR. And in those patients, uh, they, they retrieved data on 135 patients. Uh, the first, uh, the first result really showed that frontline BR really achieves an excellent response with about 80% Going, achieving a CR and a 20% PR. And in those responding patients, this was about half of them received maintenance rituximab, half did not. Uh, please remember, uh, be aware that this is a retrospective analysis. So that's why there is some difference in the, um, in the percentages. And at a median follow-up of 3.1 years, when they looked back, they were able to show a median overall survival benefit for maintenance rituximab. Uh, which was not reached uh, was six years in the uh, observation arm. However, when the study, when the results were dissected further, this Im improvement in uh, the uh, improvement in maintenance by improvement in survival in by maintenance rituximab really favored the group that were in partial response with a very significant p-value. Again, patients who were in a CR really did not have any benefit from uh, maintenance rituximab. The flat iron database again looked at the same um, same question, and this is a large uh, European uh, effort in which they. Uh, looked at a large group of patients, uh, the two endpoints were time to next treatment and overall survival. And in which they were able to show that BR plus maintenance rituximab had the best benefit of in terms of time to next treatment as compared to BR without maintenance rituximab. This is the first study that, that, that which also showed an, a complete overall survival benefit of maintenance rituximab. Uh, so this really, 
confuses the current uh, the the data that was previously present to the data that is being shown right now. The exact reason for this is still not uh, uh, clear because the paper has not been uh, been published. The abstract was just presented at. Um, the EHA meeting in 2012. So we are looking forward to uh, further information from this database. So the E1411 study is another study that I'm going to very, very uh, briefly talk about. And, and, and in this study, what they, they have what two questions. The first question was that whether addition of Belcade improves uh, response. And in the consolidation setting, does addition of lenalidomide have any benefit over single agent rituximab? So the bottom line, so this, is, this study has just finished uh, accrual and uh, there was no PFS benefit in the B BR versus BVR arm. But one of the very interesting analysis of the study was MRD analysis very early in the post-induction phase. That is, MRD was checked by flow cytometry after three cycles. And what the, and they were done by very sensitive methods, both by NGS and flow. And what the uh, investigators were able to prove that patients who were MRD negative, they really do benefit from a very, very good PFS uh, benefit. So this really starts to uh, bring the entire concept of MRD analysis and should we be checking CR rates as per MRT. And we're looking forward to data with regards to that. Um, so what is the, are the basic, uh, the new combination treatments which have been used in untreated mantle cell lymphoma? So the OASIS study looked at the combination of ibrutinib, venetoclax, and obentuzumab. The, the, the protocol is given right here. So this was a phase one, phase two study. This is uh, was a ASH paper, uh, abstract in 2018, with the primary uh, uh, endpoint of the phase one uh, two was the medium to uh, tolerated dose safety, efficacy, and PFS of OF OS were the secondary endpoints. Now, with regards to the response rates, uh, so they were able to meet uh, so, so, the, so what they were able to show that the overall response rate at the end of six cycles was very impressive at about 93%, and 100% of the evaluable patients were, were MRD negative. So, so this is a very, very encouraging and exciting data. And what is really interesting is that majority of the patients were able to achieve MRD negativity in cycle three. So that, so this, so this, combination treatment is, prove, is proving to be extremely efficacious and resulting in deep early responses. How does that really translate into survival benefit will really need to be determined when the entire data set has been uh, revealed. Um, there are some other trials that have been looking at uh, how do we tease patients out further who are going to, going to need more intensive treatment versus less intensive treatment? So the EA4151 study is looking at the uh, looking at randomizing patients with re with respects to MRD negativity um, with uh, respects to MRD negativity into two arms versus those need needing autologous transplant versus those who are receive induction therapy alone, followed by rituximab maintenance. So uh, this is a study that is currently being accrued. The two other exciting studies that are, that are currently in the phase of accrual, both include a BTK inhibitor upfront in first line therapy, along with uh, vendamustine and rituximab. So the first study is a, is a SHINE study, which is looking at ibrutinib. The second is the LISA study, which is looking at acalabrutinib. So uh, the um, uh, accrual is currently underway and we should be getting the res results shortly in a year or two. The, the A4181 study is also looking at uh, addition of PTK inhibitors along with cytarabine. So this is in the patients in which who we are considering um, uh, more intensive chemotherapy approaches. And in those patients, they, are, they have three arms of BR or 
time for three cycles versus cytarabine for three cycles, for, which is the standard of which is similar to the standard of care. Um, the second arm, which is experimental arm, includes BR cytarabine with acalabrutinib, and the third arm is BR and acalabrutinib alone. So this is again a very interesting st a study, and we are looking forward to these results. Now shifting gears and talking a little bit about the relapsed refractory setting of in mantle cell lymphoma. So this is this table that I put up really uh, looks at all the novel agents that have been approved for relapsed refractory mantle cell, the ones with the asterisk are the ones that have been received approval already. So we really do have a lot of treatment options that are available. Uh, and so, so the whole, uh, uh, the whole, uh, um, art is picking the right drug and the right combination for our patients. So there are currently three BTK inhibitors that are approved, which is the ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, uh, um, and uh, the doses of these are written right here. For some of us who've used these BTK inhibitors, we all know that the ibrutinib tends to have, us to have more toxicity, such as um, cardiotoxic effects, such as hypertension, um, atrial fibrillation, uh, secondary cancers. Other very important one is the GI side effects. The acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib are the second and third generation BTK inhibitors have a much, much better toxicity profile. So looking at combinations of BTK in, uh, inhibitors, the first one that I'm going to talk about is ibrutinib with rituximab. This is the phase two trial published in Lancet Oncology in 2016, which is showing that the com this combination therapy results in a very uh, um, impressive BFS uh, for, for this combination of almost 80% at 12 months. Uh, so what about ibrutinib with venetoclax? Venetoclax, again, is a very active agent in mantle cell lymphoma. So this uh, is, uh, is, so in this study, uh, this was a phase two study in which all patients underwent uh, initial run in period of with ibrutinib alone. And then venetoclax was added at week five. The reason for adding it at week five was to decrease the incidence of the tumor lysis syndrome, which we know is a, is a, a well-known issue with venetoclax. So the two arms were either ibrutinib, uh, so, at, so uh, at, I'm sorry, so venetoclax was added at week five, and venetoclax ibrutinib was then continued until, until uh, toxicity or progression. The primary endpoint was CR at week 16. And uh, so the results of this study, before I go to that, I just want to point out one of the important in the patient characteristics that about half of these patients were TP53 mutated, so this is a very high risk group. And most of these patients had more, had, had more than two lines of treatment. So Going into the primary endpoint, which was BFS at six weeks, the study met its primary endpoint with a CR rate without a PET scan um, of 42%. Uh, so updated at three-year analysis, which were presented in ASH in 2019, uh, they showed a very impressive BFS at about 18 months of 60% and overall survival at 18 months of over 70%. So this is very impressive in a high-risk relapse refractory group um, who has seen multiple lines of therapy. So the next... Uh, so this is basically led on to a phase three study, which is a synthetical study in which a gluten and venetoclax uh, uh, is looked, uh, is, is, is being studied. The, this uh, study is still currently being approved, but the initial results were, were uh, reported and uh, in 2020 just a few months ago, in which they reported the initial results of their run-in period. And what is, uh, and so far, 21 patients were accrued. And in those 21, they're seeing an overall response rates of about 81% with a very impressive CR rate of 62%. So going to very quickly to the novel uh, agents that are currently in novel BTK inhibitors that are currently being studied. The new kid on the block is fritobrutinib. Um, uh, this uh, was um, this is one of the uh, newer. Uh, BTK inhibitors, which has shown a very Im impressive overall response rate and a duration of response in uh, patients who had already received a BTK inhibitor before, as shown with the overall response rate of over 50%. The phase three trial is currently underway and accruing uh, of, uh, uh, of pyrotrope 
PNIP, and the primary endpoint for this trial is progression-free survival. One of the uh, interesting uh, studies that I came across in ASH uh, last year was the effect of pirtubrutinib in patients who had already received a VTK inhibitor and venetoclax. So this was really demonstrated in, in an animal mod, um, uh, model with, with a cell line, which had already, uh, which was ibrutinib resistant then was treated with venetoclax. And then after treatment with venetoclax, the remaining cells were then introduced into the mice. And, and these mice were then treated with combinations. So, so this is a vehicle which is showing the tumor size and the treatment with single agent venetoclax, single agent ibrutinib did not show such a good response. However, when you treated it with a combination of Pirobrutinib and venetoclax, you had a very significant uh, uh, decrease in the tumor volume. So this is um, uh, this is a very exciting uh, uh, discovery in uh, this new novel BTK inhibitor. So no talk for regarding non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, particularly B cell is complete without talking about CAR T cells, and it and such as is the story in mantle cell as well. Uh, there's a CD19 pro CAR T product, uh, Brexocaptogene, which has been approved in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, its claim to fame was a Zuma 2 trial published in NEJM in 2020, in which these patients received, uh, uh, so, so, so these patients who were relapsed and refractory to multiple lines of therapy received uh, standard bridging therapy if needed, followed by conditioning therapy, which is a standard of care, and the infusion of the CAR T cell product. So 71 patients were included, uh, included in this trial, and the results pretty much speak for themselves. So 93% of these patients had an objective response rate with over about 70% who were in CR. Patients who were in CR, they continue to have a very good duration of response when which a uh, number of patients were um, are long-term responders and in CR. Progression-free survival, not reached, overall survival is also not reached. So my take-home points um, at the end of my talk, just to, just to summarize uh, all that I talked about. So the first thing is the, the role of maintenance rituximab. Uh, after our CHOP as induction therapy, we do have randomized data that maintenance rituximab shows benefit. However, maintenance rituximab after ER is still controversial. We have two studies which have shown a PFS benefit. We have one study which has shown an overall survival benefit, but these studies are all retrospective. Uh, again, the uh, consistently, what we have shown is that patients who are in a CR, they don't derive that kind of benefit with maintenance rituximab. So that also, that also needs to be addressed. Also, how we define CR now going forward with the more, uh, ramp, uh, more acceptable use of MRD assessment, that, uh, that which will also need to be addressed. BTK inhibitors are um, the game changers in mantle cell lymphoma, they have been approved as single agents in the relapse refractory setting, and they have very encouraging and exciting data in the upfront set setting as well, and will likely result to a change in the treatment paradigm in patients who are, in patients who are not candidates for high-dose therapy. Uh, in the relapse refractory setting, I said again that they are uh, the first-line treatment of choice, but it is a combination of BTK inhibitors with other targeted therapies such as venetoclax or lenalidomide, which are very attractive options and which can, which can lead to a very, very durable and long-lasting responses. Um, CAR T cells shows an impressive overall response rate and durability of response. Um, it is a very valid treatment option in the relapse refractory setting and will likely move it to the second line um, setting um, as well. So I am going to end right there and I thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions in the Q&A session. Dr. Munira, thank you very much. Uh, gave a very good review overall. And mental cell is a headache world over because ultimately these patients come back whatever they do. So this is a big issue and let's see, hope, let's hope they, next few years time. Mm -hmm. So first of all, Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ghazilbash. 
assalamu alaikum thank you and ha uh, dr salman assalamu alaikum uh, thank you i am not at all in the panel but as a president of pakistan society of hematology i just want to thank all the speakers and uh, for their excellent talks and uh, especially dr kazal baj and i know it's middle of the night and we were not at all expecting in fact before the start of this session we thought that you would probably not be there in the in the q and a but thanks a lot and we all enjoyed your your excellent presentation on car t cells in myeloma and and the encouraging results that you have shown thanks oh. a lot thank you very much thank, thank you, very you. Much. thank you very much uh, it's an honor to be here thank you okay. thank you very much so, all the speakers uh, first of all i express my gratitude to the president pakistan society of hematology and the organizers for honoring me to be the chair of this very important session despite the fact that i don't consider myself worthy of this chair uh, we thank all the speakers especially dr muzaffar ahmed kazalbash from md anderson cancer center used in texas for sparing his precious time and putting us wiser on car t cell and multiple myeloma and then dr rahil iftikhar we appreciate the hard work put in by dr rahil iftikhar himself and all the three societies that is pakistan society of hematology society of medical oncology of pakistan and society of clinical oncology for uh, compiling the guidelines local guidelines on the treatment of diffuse large p cell lymphoma and thank you very much uh, munira for an elaborate management of mental cell lymphoma starting with the conventional and then adding botulinumab lenalidomide ibrutinib acalabrutinib zanabrutinib and finally venetoclax and car t cells thank you very much you and we are saying. happy to take uh, questions if there is any and dr swan sheikh yes. tell us yes yes so one question uh, to dr fazil baj uh, where do you see myeloma in 2030 because there are number of drugs in pipeline and uh, there are some, uh, some uh, 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 articles although there is a prog progression free survival definitely with autologous transplant but overall survival with, even with vld is now reaching up to with maintenance reaching up to uh, the transplanted patient so where do you see in 2030 and can we decrease the toxicity of car t cell at present there is no facility of car t cell in pakistan although i know there are few centers in india in india but not in pakistan and i don't know one of my colleague in shifa probably trained from somewhere but still there is no uh, no one here to provide this facility so main my question main question is there is that that where do you see myeloma in 2030 ji um thank you very much uh, you know uh, answers to questions like these uh, are very very difficult and your guess is as good as mine uh, on where something will be in 10 years uh, but of course we can all uh, speculate based on the best available data so uh, first of all uh, in 10 years i don't think that uh, uh, in 2010 any of us could have predicted about uh, Uh, the availability of so many bi-specific antibodies and CAR T cells in multiple myeloma and the kind of responses that we are seeing, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we are also seeing that improvements are incremental and there is tremendous growth in the availability of effective drugs for all the diseases because of uh, better understanding of the disease biology and with the biotechnology and immunology and targeted drug revolution availability of different treatments uh, having said that um, the improvements are still uh not as dramatic if you look at all the patients overall access to treatment so simple answers i think today in 2022 uh the standard approach whether you are in karachi or you are in houston or new york or london uh i think the uh, the way to treat multiple myeloma patient who are transplant eligible which uh given the access of treatment most people are that you would do induction treatment ideally with at least a three drug regimen uh for transplant eligible patient uh, and that three drug regimen in most situation would be a combination of proteasome inhibitor immunomodulatory drug and steroids provided they are 
available. Uh, in uh, some patients, again, if the drug is available and affordable, you may want to add an anti uh, CD38 monoclonal antibody, um, high risk patients, bulky disease, etc. Autologous transplant, if available, would be the next thing, followed by maintenance treatment. And in most patients, it would be uh, lenalidomide maintenance treatment. In high-risk patients, now data are emerging that perhaps a combination, a proteasome inhibitor with lenalidomide, or perhaps a monoclonal antibody with lenalidomide. And again, all these things depend on the access. The newer treatments are showing great activity. We still have to see their toxicities. Uh, we still have to see them moving up front in early stages. Uh, and um, the data that they are good enough to replace existing treatment. Uh, so CAR T cells, of course, are great, as you saw the response rates, but you can also see that these are not easy treatments. These are very expensive treatment. And especially in multiple myeloma, one can make the case that although we are seeing unprecedented responses, there is no plateau in survival curves. So if you're giving a treatment which is this expensive and at the same time toxic and so difficult to get, uh, it's not for everyone. Uh, and access to treatment is another big problem, uh, especially since the availability of uh, Ida cell in United States, I would say one in 15 to one in 20 patients who are potentially eligible, which is a small number, have access to the treatment. So we have to overcome all of these things. So where in 2030, I think we will be seeing more of these treatments being incorporated earlier on which will again depend on their cost, their effectiveness, their toxicity, how best to combine. I think your guess is as good as mine, but we'll probably be seeing more of these treatments moving up front, some with or some without stem cell transplant. That's the best I can tell you at this point. Oh, okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, question to um, Dr. Rahil. In fact, you uh, presented the the guidelines, um, uh, very elaborate guidelines, in fact. Um, uh, consider, coming to the recommendations for uh, the testicular lymphomas. So what are your thoughts of, of a person, for example, if he has had bilateral orchidectomy? So would it be RCHOP plus intrathecal chem chemotherapy plus minus end of the treatment method like that, which which obviously in uh, not possible in the low uh, income areas but is radiotherapy indicated in that group in person who has had a testicular lymphoma but had bilateral orchidectomy done so um, as per my knowledge sir uh, there is no uh, data to support that if there is bilateral orchidectomy these patients should receive radiotherapy to a scrotum so for unilateral involvement it is recommended However, there is retrospective data that say that even if you radiate them, uh, so there is involvement of seminiferous tubules and collecting ducts, they are microinfiltration with lymphoma. So it may be helpful, but there is no clear cut answer to that. There is no recommendation that if there is bilateral orchidectomy, scrotal radiation should be done. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. There are a few questions, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, you already uh, did a wonderful job by publishing. Uh, the guidelines and uh, again uh, uh, for limited stage disease stage 1 or 2 there is a flyer uh, uh, study and another study last year uh, in 2020 published in which they give just 3 r chop followed by PET scan if the PET scan is negative just give one more r chop and that's all and more than only 2 deaths out of 138 patients in the long run, there is no radiation therapy. Similarly with flyer, however in flyer, after four RCHOP, they give two more rituximab. But in the other one, which I, uh, 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 which I uh, uh, already forwarded to you at that time also, but you still, in your recommendation, I have seen that you want, you still recommend radiation therapy. So now, say for example, in near future, if we revisit the guideline, can we make some changes after discussion with the expertise you have. One, 
number two dr salman already mentioned there is up to 38 percent patient with testicular lymphoma presented with some time in life presented with cns disease which is a big number you have just so shown that the role of two high dose in the end of the treatment of arch of with high cns uh, uh, ipi uh, so still we can omit in uh, these patient in cohort of patient with testicular lymphoma the high dose mtx okay. and the third question is that that primary mediastinal b cell lymphoma now the primary uh, mediastinal b cell lymphoma is not actually dl bcl it is basically tilted towards hodgkin agar genetic makeup pe jaye sorry so in that case up to aage studies more than 90% of the time those are just say epoch is sufficient whereas the other thing which is important if you see at the uh, distribution of patient mostly young and females if you give radiation to young patients then it will lead to coronary and thyroid or any of these things and more than 90% and superior to our chop and radiation so my just thought process that we can we discuss among uh, again and we can Uh, if you could please thank you sir so thank you very much sir so uh, i think all of them are very relevant question so uh, in our uh, guideline which we documented so actually it was resource resource allocation that was done so the resource allocation was done into limited resources and into enhanced resources so the one which i have presented right now is the part of the guideline which is for limited resources because once we have a retrospective review of our centers as well in pakistan i think there are only three centers who are able to give infusional regimen so if we start uh, one by one uh, regarding primary mediastinal b cell lymphoma so in pakistan there are only three centers who have who are giving or who are have the ability to give infusional regimens in primary mediastinal b cell lymphoma in most of the centers mediastinal b cell lymphoma is treated either with archop or chop so the part which i uh, shown uh, today was that of limited resources in the same guideline the which have been published in uh, gco general in enhanced resources we have written that if resources permit a dose adjusted epoch r is preferable which i showed in the slide as well but what was happening was that in limited resources once we actually had a retrospective audit and input from different societies archop alone was given and these patients were not followed up later uh, and uh, because pet scan was not done uh, so once if for these patient pet scan is done and pet scan shows cr uh, these patients can do away with radiotherapy so we had a, uh, a review published on primary mediastinal b cell lymphoma in journal of leukemia and lymphoma in 2021 uh it was it involved our center uh, center from uh, us and uh, shifa international and few others so in that we clearly actually shown uh that if after our job the pet scan shows cr the radiotherapy is not needed so the females who achieve cr after our job they can do away with radiotherapy but if we do not give them radiotherapy these patients will ultimately relapse however i totally agree that those adjusted epoch r is preferable and especially in a cohort in which females are uh, the one who are mostly affected radiotherapy free regimens should be uh, advocated uh, second uh, was sir regarding uh, limited uh, stage dl bcl and the role of fly trial similarly again uh, the guidelines which we have published we have categorically divided into limited resources and enhanced resources so by definition limited resource setting is that which does not have access to pet scan fly trial is based on pet scan uh, in order to give rituximab so once we have not uh, uh, done pet scan for emission assessment so we not uh, cannot follow the path of uh, fly trial so uh, in guidelines we have uh, written that if uh, there are enhanced resources if pet scan is done uh, we can follow fly trial pathway and it actually would be cheaper Uh, so but if in limited resources pet scan is not done and ct scan is used then either combined modality or six r chop uh, should be used and thirdly sir regarding testicular dl bcl uh, 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 in which the rose of end of treatment high dose methotrexate so the cohort uh, that was recently uh, published by mm-hmm. uh, tilia tall in nagm and uh, there was studies from uh, uk as well 
the high uh, risk DLBCL group actually included testicular DLBCL as well. So similarly, oh, uh, if if uh, resources permit, like in our center, we are still using high dose methotrexate uh, for high risk DLBCL. We have not shifted to IT MTX. But for most of the centers, so what we have seen once we were um, having uh, these guidelines that even uh, most of the centers for high risk DLBCL, they do not offer intrathecal chemotherapy prophylaxis as well. And in most of the center, even um, uh, risk staging is not done. So in order to uh, enable and um, facilitate them for limited resources, ITM takes for that. Dr. Munira, if I may ask a question. Sure, uh, please, thanks, go ahead. Thanks a lot, excellent, excellent talk. Um, considering the high risk of relapse in, in mental cell lymphoma, Haji. is there a recommendation or a head-to-head -head trial of an upfront auto transplantation post chemotherapy versus maintenance treatment in mental cell lymphoma, which is being considered. So, uh, as far as I know, there's no, there's not been a head-to-head upfront trial. There is one trial that is currently actually underway, Jiska, which I, I, I put a slide up in which they are actually looking at, M, uh, like. After an initial induction, patients who are MRD negative at a midpoint, then they get uh, randomized into uh, continuing the standard of care followed by rituximab maintenance versus transplant followed by rituximab maintenance. So we should have the answer for that. Uh, I think that would answer your question. Uh, but at this point in time, I think anybody who is transplant eligible um, would would get a transplant upfront uh, for mantle cell lymphoma. We do know that these patients they they relapse, uh, they then they continue to relapse over time. Upfront transplantation can then you can you can have survivals of uh, progression free survivals of five years, six years, and more. So you know that gives you that long survival benefit that you want for your patient. So at this point in time, if that data doesn't come out, I don't think I might be, I'll be able to answer that question. Sir, may I mm -hmm. have a uh, humble submission at this uh -huh, forum uh -huh. from the platform uh -huh. of uh, Pakistan Society of Hematology, as uh, Rahil and all three societies have formulated local guidelines for DLBCL, so uh, we should have local uh, Pakistani guidelines uh, for uh, resource limited or enhanced resources for all the diseases one by one. And these study groups on different um, diseases, hematological diseases, which have been made, which are not that functional, uh, we request you to uh, push them for making local guidelines. Thank you very much, sir. Gee, Dr. Marine, that's, thank you so much for bringing this up because we've been talking about this at different forums as well. So I think the next, next one that we're going to actually hopefully try and pick up soon is, is multiple myeloma. And I think multiple myeloma is, is really suffers in Pakistan because we don't have the meds and we don't have the expertise um, and we don't have uh, availability. So hopefully, Dr. Kazalbash, we'll be getting in touch with you when we start to do that. And I have sure. a question from Dr. Kazabash, sir. Um, the maintenance, uh, maintenance post auto transplant with lenalidomide. Uh, do you have any recommendation for stopping lenalidomide at some point in time post auto transplant? Sure. Uh, so again, uh, as you know, uh, there are no real data available at this point. So it, so it depends on uh, uh, what guidelines do you follow. So as you know, in most of the European countries, especially in France, uh, they follow limited uh, duration maintenance up to two years or in uh, some places up to one year. In the US, based on the intergroup trial, uh, which was also published in 2012 with longer follow-up, uh, the uh, trend is continue till progression uh, or um, until toxicities uh, stop it. So that's a very important question that is being ad addressed in a number of clinical trials uh, uh, that are there patients who can stop maintenance at a certain point? Like if you have sustained MRD mm. negative disease, no high risk features, uh, uh, those are the patients where one could consider stopping maintenance treatment after say 12 months or 
at least two years of uh, uh, maintenance therapy. So that is one thing to consider because clinical trials are asking that question. And of course, there are patients who cannot tolerate that. Uh, you would stop maintenance treatment with lenalidomide, but then now with the availability of other drugs, at least in the United States, people try to transition them to something like daratumumab. So it's a good question uh, being addressed in clinical trials. So outside of clinical trials, someone who's in CR, who has MRD negative disease based on the best available testing, you may consider stopping it in standard risk patients after two years, given the limitations of the data. Thank you, Thank you very much. Just to um, add to that, so long-term outcomes of stamina trial actually uh, uh, gave this answer as well, in which the patients in which lenalidomide was stopped, they had inferior progression to survival. So stamina trial is one of that evidence we can follow. Absolutely. And the original intergroup trial, same thing. And if you remember the debate when those trials were done, that uh, the, uh, the French trial did not show an improvement in overall survival, while the U.S. intergroup trial consistently showed an improvement in overall survival. Of course, the cost and second primary malignancies and other toxicities go with any treatment that you take, but they looked at all those things as events and still event-free and overall survival was better with long-term continuous maintenance. Thank you very much, sir. Despite the leukemogenic potential of lenalidomide, we are currently uh, continuing it still progression. Can I ask one quick question? And this is a question that I get asked by many, uh, um, some patients who approach me from Pakistan. So of uh, the proteasome inhibitors, uh, immunomodulatory drugs, and uh, anti-CD38 antibodies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is currently available in Pakistan, especially of the newer ones. I know that uh, uh, bortezomib is, ava uh, is available and, uh, uh, and lenalidomide is available. Uh, is uh, uh, daratumumab, uh, carfilzomib, uh, palmalidomide, are do those things easily and, available? Right, Dr. Kasavash. Uh, so they are available. So they are, uh, so we are able to get carfilzomib, palmalidomide, dara, exazomib. We are able to get these drugs. Some of them, but uh, but unfortunately, none of these are DRAP approved. So they come, come in through the gray channel. So there is always a question about uh, how good these medicines are. Uh, having said that, um, at least I have anecdotal experience of using all four of them, and we've been using it very successfully. The issue is, especially with daratumumab, is, is it's extremely expensive. So you know how the, how it is... Uh, how it starts and you kind of go from it from a weekly and then you move on eight weeks and then 16 weeks. So that really ramps up, up the cost. So I've only been able to give it to one or two patients. That's it. Um, so, but, but carfilzomib and palmalidomide are very, very frequently used. And we've recently been able to acquire exazomib as well. And uh, yes. daratumumab is available subcutaneously also. IV. We have IV. it IV. We have okay. it IV. Yeah. Okay. And Thank the, you. And, and the, they are available, but the availability is, is erratic, in fact, because they, as Dr. Manira pointed out, they are smuggled from here and there. So availability, availability at times uh, becomes a problem because, the, because they are not DRAP approved. The hospitals can't, can't keep it in their ph pharmacies. So they are available outside from the outside channels. The, other the same here. COVID. Same COVID. here. Carfilzomib and pomalidomide are very easily available. But that is a bit difficult, and we have not used this very frequently. Okay. Now I request Dr. Marine to conclude the session. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, uh, President Pakistan Society of Hematology, for um, arranging such a wonderful workshop. And thank you very much, all the three speakers. Thank you very much, moderator. Uh, my special thanks to Dr. Muzaffar Ahmed Kazalbash to be with us in the middle of the night, uh, Dr. Rahil Iftikhar, Dr. Manira Musaji, and excellent moderation by Dr. Usman Sheikh. Thank you very much, everybody. Have thank a good you. evening. Thank, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.